Coming up on Jerusalem Dateline, fallout in the U.S. after Senator Chuck Schumer's comments on Israel and reactions from former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman. Benjamin Netanyahu vows to resist international pressure about Rafa and political analysis from journalist podcaster Carolyn Glick. Plus, bringing new life to the site of the Nova Music Festival. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Israeli leaders reacted to what some are calling an unprecedented call by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer for new elections so Israelis can replace the coalition government of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The comments came in the midst of the worst crisis the Jewish people have faced since the Holocaust. Speaking from the Senate floor Thursday, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has lost his way and called for a change in Israel's government. By allowing his political survival to take the precedence over the best interests of Israel, the Netanyahu coalition no longer fits the needs of Israel after October 7th. The world has changed radically since then. Schumer's speech comes as a growing number of Democrats are urging the Biden administration to step up public pressure on Israel to halt its war on Hamas. Schumer charges Netanyahu's coalition consists of far-right extremists who have been too willing to tolerate the toll of the war on civilians in Gaza. Israel cannot survive if it becomes a pariah. Netanyahu responded in a statement saying, Israel expects Schumer to refrain from undermining the Israeli government. Israel's ambassador to the U.S., Michael Herzog, wrote on X, Israel is a sovereign democracy. It is unhelpful, all the more so as Israel is at war against the genocidal terror organization Hamas to comment on the political scene of a democratic ally. Former Israeli Prime Minister Niftali Bennett said, We are an independent nation, not a banana republic. Israeli opposition leader Yair Lapid criticized Netanyahu, calling Schumer's speech proof that one by one Netanyahu is losing Israel's biggest supporters in the U.S. Schumer's speech is especially surprising because of his past support for Netanyahu. In 2015, he was one of a few Democrats who voted against President Barack Obama's Iran deal and didn't speak out against Netanyahu for his speech to Congress criticizing the deal. Moments after Schumer spoke, congressional Republican leaders slammed his comments. It's just plain wrong for an American leader to play such a divisive role in Israeli politics while our closest ally in the region is in an existential battle for its very survival. The Jewish state of Israel deserves an ally that acts like one. Israel is not a colony of America whose leaders serve at the pleasure of the party in power in Washington. Senator Lindsey Graham called it earth-shattering bad and said to Schumer, you've done a lot of damage, my friend, and you need to fix this. In a more measured tone, Democratic Senator Ben Cardin said, as allies and friends, we must support the Israeli people in their efforts to shape their own destiny and chart the course of their post-war nation. In the meantime, the military campaign to defeat Hamas hinges on Israel entering Rafah, the last stronghold of the terrorist group in Gaza. Despite enormous pressure from the U.S. and other nations, Netanyahu pledges Israel will go on. I will continue to repel the pressures and we will enter Rafah. We will complete the elimination of the remaining Hamas battalions and we will restore security and bring absolute victory to the people of Israel and the state of Israel. Undermining Israeli government. That's the charge Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu leveled at Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer after he called for new leadership in Israel. Former U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Friedman joined CBN President Gordon Robertson on the 700 Club to discuss this and other issues facing Israel. 
Look, I think this was a very dark day, maybe historically dark day in the history of the relationship between the United States and Israel. Um, it was a gut punch that uh, Schumer leveled against Israel. Look, um, Benjamin Netanyahu is a political figure and, you know, there'll be an election, you know, one of these days and, you know, he'll win or he'll lose or maybe he won't run. That's all, you know, down the road. Right now, the people of Israel um, are standing with Benjamin Netanyahu because he's their leader in a time of war. And Schumer knows that. And to try to um, divide Israel, you know, uh, at this time when they're facing this existential battle where they're on the cusp of finally defeating this implacable foe in Hamas is, as I think I agree with Lindsey Graham, I mean, Schumer did an enormous amount of damage. And, and, and you know what the crazy thing is, you know, they want a ceasefire, they want a hostage deal. What Schumer did made it very unlikely that they will get either, because as Hamas sees America moving away from Israel, Hamas has no reason to compromise. They think they're going to win this war. And that's a terrible signal that Schumer sent to the uh, into the Middle East. Well, that's my my main complaint against it is that if if you're on the other side, if you're the terrorist sitting in a tunnel, you, you literally are saying, all I have to do now is wait. And if I wait yeah. long enough, I'm going to win. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the point that Schumer made is if Israel doesn't follow America's uh, military directives, uh, America is going to abandon Israel. America is going to use its leverage, its 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 uh, treasury, its uh, its money, its weaponry. It's it's going to withhold all that from Israel until Israel, you know, cows to the uh, to the sovereign. You know, that's that's what the Shumar is saying. And so this is music to Hamas's ears. And by the way, it ought to terrify everybody because if Hamas, you know, is is not eliminated, if Hamas survives this war intact, even with a couple of battalions. That's a template for terrorists all around the world to commit atrocities, to take hostages, and then to bargain for victory as the United States, you know, uh, softens on 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 fighting. You, you saw yesterday that you know we just gave another ten billion dollars to Iran in the middle of this war. We're we're funding Iran with massive amounts of money. You know the policies here are maddening, and um and and I just wish we could we could turn this around. Well, it seems like history is repeating again and again here that, you know, there's uh, these outbursts of terrorist attacks and then suddenly everybody wants to start talking peace and, and forcing Israel into a, a peace settlement, peace negotiations. It just seems to to be a reward for terrorism. Not just to uh, a peace negotiation, but to uh, unilaterally uh, impose upon Israel a Palestinian state. I mean, can you imagine you have 80 percent of the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria that celebrated the October 7th attacks? Don't just support them, but celebrated them. And now uh, as, as the outcome, we're going to give these people a platform to continue to uh, continue their efforts to destroy Israel. I mean, it's completely upside down. And, and I think, you know, one other point, which I think people need to understand, you know, Netanyahu, uh, really does have the support of the Israeli people as a war leader. You know, whether they like him as a politician or not, this is not going to weaken Netanyahu. This is going to weaken America. It's actually going to do exactly the opposite of what Schumer is trying to accomplish. Well, I liken Netanyahu to uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, he was the prime minister in wartime, and then after the war, uh, he, they, they voted him out. So, you know, we'll see what happens. I'm not making a, any predictions here. I do want to talk about what you just said about 80 percent, because I think a lot of people don't get, don't get this. I'm going to quote the Palestinian Center for Policy Survey and Research. They put out a survey December 13th, 23. Now, uh, I hear that the Palestinian Center is actually they're, they're not cooking the books. They're not making up numbers like the uh, Ministry of Health in Gaza. But uh, they are saying 52% of Gazans, this is after October 7th, 85% of West Bank um, respondents, so this would be 72% of Palestinians overall, are voicing satisfaction with how Hamas is conducting the war, satisfaction with October 7th. Uh, do you think anyone in the current administration understands they're they're actually rejoicing over October seventh, and and they want Hamas to lead them? 
yeah, I think they may know that, but I don't think they care. I think what they care about are, you know, 100,000 voters in Dearborn, Michigan, or maybe in Minnesota or someplace else that in a tough swing state have the capacity to alter the outcome of the election. That's all this is about. None of this is about getting to the right outcome in uh, in Israel. The right outcome in Israel, uh, I think everybody would have to agree that has you know a working brain is to defeat Hamas. Um, with if you don't defeat Hamas, they're going to come back. They've said they'll come back and slaughter Jews. So I mean that's the right outcome. After that, we can talk about how to rebuild and how to restructure. But you have to defeat them after this war. That's not what uh, Biden and Schumer are talking about. What they're talking about is is finding a way to thread a needle. On the one hand, they say, you know, we love Israel, and, and maybe that placates the Democratic Jewish voters, you know, who, who support Israel. On the other hand, they say, we're going to cut off the resources for Netanyahu, and somehow that's going to placate the far, you know, left, woke, you know, Palestinian Arab communities throughout the country that, that are small in number, but do have in certain swing states some real influence. So they're trying to play it both ways. My prediction is they're offending everybody. And that Trump's going to win in a landslide. But that's that's, you know, we won't know that for nine months. But right now, what Schumer and Biden are doing is all about politics. They couldn't care less about what the outcome will be in Israel. That's not their concern right now. Were you surprised that it was Schumer that did this? It was so disappointing, you know, because, look, I, you know, I grew up in New York. Um, I've known him for a very long time. Uh, I've always considered him to be. A, a political animal. You know, they say the most dangerous place in the world is between Chuck Schumer and a camera. You know, so I, I've, I've always known that politics was his was his God, if you will. But um, but I didn't know that he would go this far. I mean, to to undermine Israel at a time of war when they're fighting for their lives is an absolute low point in the uh, in the relationship between the United States Senate and the state of Israel. And he's and he's parroting the uh, Biden as well. He cleared this with Biden before he gave the speech. So it's it's deeply troubling and disappointing. And um, and I think ultimately um, th there will there'll be there'll be a price that he has to pay. I think people will ultimately reject what he's done. And his I don't think history will be kind to Chuck Schumer. Coming up, the disconnect between the U.S. and Israel is the U.S. attempting to tie Israel's hands in its war with Hamas. Israeli-American Carolyn Glick's political analysis can be seen in leading newspapers and journals around the world. She reported recently about the efforts by some in the U.S. government to present a narrative that the Netanyahu government is about to fall. We asked her about that and more. Carolyn Glick, great to be with you here on CBN News. There's a lot going on between Israel and the United States, the Biden administration and the Netanyahu government. How would you describe the state of U.S.-Israel relations right now? Well, I mean, again, if you look at the American people, then according to the polling that just came out a couple weeks ago from Harvard-Harris poll, 82% of Americans support Israel, 18% of Americans support Hamas, which is alarming in and of itself, but 82% of the American people support Israel. Unfortunately, that support is becoming uh, increasingly unshared by the Biden administration, which seems uh, a bit out of touch with uh, popular sentiment in the United States, because what we've been seeing, particularly over the past several weeks and with increasing sort of velocity over the past several days, is that the Biden administration just wants this war to end. And when, you know, I mean, I think it was uh, George Orwell said the quickest way to end a war is to lose it. And that's what they want Israel to do, because they want this war over now and you know israel still has work to do we're in the middle of a war i mean we have a the u.s military academies uh, the head of their urban warfare center he was on my podcast this week his name is uh, professor john spencer he's a colonel in the u.s military and he said look israel is it's its success in this war is unmatched both in terms of limiting civilian casualties and in terms of the the complexity of the environment, General Petraeus said it as well the other day. So they're looking at this, no army, not the U.S. military in Iraq and Afghanistan, nowhere has ever fought the kind of urban warfare environment that Israel is fighting in. And we're doing spectacular work. It takes a long time. We have 450 miles of underground tunnels that are Hamas's military infrastructure. And, we're, and we figured out a way to fight inside of the tunnels, something that no military has ever done. And here, 
is the Biden administration say, no, show's over. You know, yeah, it's true that you've, uh, you've, you've conquered more of Gaza than we did of Mosul in a quarter of the time. But uh, no, we've decided that you're losing and that you got to quit. And so that's a big problem. And what's more, you reported on your podcast something in the New York Magazine this week. What were you reporting and why is that so alarming? It's amazing, actually. The Biden administration over the past several days, it started, I think, with Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris, said that there's a, we, we draw a distinction between uh, the Netanyahu government and the people of Israel, even though the people of Israel you know, democratically elected the Netanyahu government and, and not only shares its war aims, but actually would like the war aims to be more expansive than just defeating Hamas militarily and, and, and uh, politically and bringing home the mm -hmm. hostages. Um, there are a lot of people who think that we should be annexing large swaths of Gaza. That's not part of the war aims per se. Um, but th they're trying to draw a distinction. And so she said that, and then President Biden said something very similar, that mm -hmm. Prime Minister Netanyahu doesn't have Israel's best interests at, at heart, or however you put it, but, but Biden does. And then the third thing is that uh, this New York mm -hmm. Magazine article right. came out, said that the U.S. government has, uh, senior U.S. government officials have been meeting with an Israeli expert on how to overthrow the Israeli government, that they're trying to figure out how to do it. Uh, it was reported in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times in a, you know, in, in a very clearly, uh, deliberately uh, synchronized uh, leak that the U.S. intelligence agencies, all of them, have come to the conclusion that uh, the Netanyahu government is likely to be overthrown very soon. And uh, so, you know, you don't have to be some sort of a political genius to understand that what they're saying is we want to overthrow our closest allied government in the Middle East and do it in the middle of an existential war for its own survival, which is an amazing thing. And we want to do it because we want this war to end, even though we know that ending the war now means that Hamas, a terrorist organization that's a member of the Iranian Axis, wins. Is part of the perhaps Biden administration's thinking is that we want the war to end because we want a two-state solution. Does that fit into their equation? In part, I mean, you know, they're, that's what they're pushing for. They want a total Palestinian victory in this war. They want to give the Palestinians who overwhelmingly, I mean, talking three quarters of the Palestinians, support the massacre, the invasion and slaughter of Israelis, the rape of Israelis that the Palestinians carried out on October 7th. Three quarters of Palestinians think that that was fabulous, that that was the proudest day of their lives as Palestinians was October 7th, 2023, just to get a sense. And so the American government, the Biden administration, thinks that the thing to do in the face of that kind of onslaught, that genocidal onslaught that we suffered on October 7th, is to give those very people who support that a state, and a state not, not you know, in suburban Washington, but in suburban Jerusalem. They want the Palestinian state to be in parts of Jerusalem, all of the cradle of Jewish civilization, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and Gaza. That's what they want. This is the single largest payoff for jihad in world history. They want to give them the land of Israel in exchange for the slaughter of 1,200 Israeli Jews and the cap capture of 246 uh, uh, hostages. So, I mean, this is not, you know, when, when the Biden administration, they want to personalize it. You know, they want to say this is just about Netanyahu, as if Netanyahu is some sort of implant from Mars as opposed to the democratically elected prime minister of Israel. So, you know, I think that Congress has to be looking at a lot of things. If we don't achieve the total victory that we seek, then, you know, our days are numbered. All of Hamas, Hamas is just one of many uh, proxies that are arrayed and fighting us against us by Iran. We had over 100, and, 100 missiles uh, shot into Israel today by Hezbollah, Iran's proxy in Lebanon. Right? I mean, we're facing a disaster. So if Israel doesn't achieve perfect victory, total victory, and we eradicate Hamas in Gaza, then we're inviting mass aggression from the north, from Hezbollah, from the east, from Iran's uh, militia that are operating in, in Iraq and in Syria and, and even in Jordan that want to come in from the, our eastern border. So it, it, we're inviting invasion, a greater one, with more force than what we felt on October 7th. What we suffered there was a Holocaust. How can people uh, hear you and listen to you and find you on, uh, on uh, your different platforms? Well, as you know, I'm always happy to be on your shows, but uh, you can also watch me on the Carolyn Glick uh, show, my podcast uh, that comes out three times a week now during the war 
Uh, so they can watch me there and at JNS where I'm the senior contributing editor or my website, carolynglick.com. They can read all my stuff. Great. Great to be with you, Carolyn. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you. God bless you. Up next, sending a message to the world, celebrating new life in the face of jihadist brutality. On any given day, dozens, if not hundreds of people wander through the Nova Music Festival Memorial site. It was one of the hardest hit places during Hamas's bloody massacre on October 7th. Now it has become a place for what some have called grief tourism. CBN News Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl takes us there. The location sits in this beautiful park about three miles from Gaza. Placards remembering those killed and kidnapped completed with small gardens and memorials now fill the place. Just want you to imagine over 3,000 people here dancing, trying to get away from all the horrors of life and then suddenly being reminded of how horrible things can be. They came here to enjoy. We never could have imagined what was going to happen next. New Yorker Natalie Sanandaji attended Nova Festival as part of her vacation in Israel. I danced amongst all these people. I was here, I was with them. I was dancing right next to them. Unfortunately for them, a lot of them weren't as lucky as me and they didn't make it out. She's returned twice since then and recently shared her story with Mike Pompeo and his wife. Asleep when the rocket started early that morning, a friend urged Natalie to stay calm. Try to imagine a festival happening anywhere else in the world where suddenly rockets are intercepted over people's heads and they react in such a calm manner. That simply would not happen. But unfortunately for Israelis, this is their reality. Although they escaped, terrorists murdered more than 360 people there, taking about another 40 hostage. I came to offer strength to the soldiers, to uh, offer condolences to the people who lost their loved ones, and to give hope to those who hope their families will return. Stacy Sokol from Beth Jacobs Synagogue in Beverly Hills came during a three-day mission to Israel. That it's nothing like what was reported. You don't get a sense of what was going on, of What's how the, the devastation, how bad it was. You know, it's, they, they gloss over the Hamas um, killings. Police spokesman Dean Elsden said it took weeks to identify all the bodies. The monster is, uh, is a compliment for the terrorists. Before my job, I worked in counterterrorism. I met Hamas face to face plenty of times. But this, to see what they would do if we didn't stop them from the drop in the bucket of operations that we do day to day, right here, this is it. As a sign of moving forward, Israel's Forestry Service recently sponsored tree planting here in memory of those killed. By the trees, we symbolize that the state of Israel is here to stay, and that's how we see it. And that's why we decide to celebrate life due to those horrific actions that were done here by Hamas and to tell them you can never break our spirit. We will keep on planting, we will keep on the life here in Israel. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Raim Park, site of the Nova Music Festival, Southern Israel. Still ahead, beseeching the heavens in repentance and prayer at the site of the Nova Music Festival. Also at the Nova Music Festival site, recently were representatives from the Latino Coalition for Israel. They not only toured the site, but offered prayers for repentance on behalf of the United States. Forgive us, Father, for funding UNRWA, for funding the Palestinian Authority, Father, for going back on the, uh, violating the Taylor Force Act, Father, forgive us, Lord, for funding the Palestinians to pay terrorists, Father, to murder innocent Jews. Father, the blood that has been shed on this land is on our hands, Father. We and our fathers and our people have sinned against you, Father. Father, we deserve judgment, but in the midst of judgment, remember mercy. Father, we cry out to the God of Israel today, have mercy 
upon our nation. Father, we pray for a spirit of repentance and conviction upon our leadership. Father, upon both parties, uh, the Democrats and Republicans, Father, that we would realize, Father, there are people, innocent people, that because of our failed policy have been murdered, Father, have been tortured and are still held hostage. Yes. We ask you to forgive us as a nation. Lord, not just what's happened in the last week or the last six months or the last three years, but Lord, what has happened over the last few decades. Lord, where we have pushed Israel to seek peace by giving up the land that you gave them. If you go to war in your land against an adversary that opposes you, you shall blow a truah with the trumpets and be remembered before the Lord your God and thus be saved from your enemies. Amen. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on social media and access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And please continue to pray for Israel, IDF soldiers, and for the release of all the hostages. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.